was asked to preach at our regional camp. We don't have a district camp. We have the regional camp. Um, and the theme this year for that camp was dealing with questions and, and the big questions that we have in life. And in the course of preparing for those summer sermons, um, I began to reflect on the issue of, of this fight between science and religion. The, a fight that, that has been kind of going on for, gosh, about 400 years, going all the way back into the Enlightenment. Uh, the 1600s, the 1700s, we began to see science and religion, you know, just coming to blows with each other, sometimes in very physical ways, as the church in particular began to respond to challenges to beliefs about how the universe worked um, and, and responding in ways that really did leave a mark on the face of human society. There is a fight that exists right now between science and religion. I follow, I follow you know, in both camps. I, I get news bulletins every day from, from scientific arenas. I get news information from religious arenas. And, and almost every week, I've, there's not been a week that I can remember where there hasn't been at least two or three articles dealing with just this very subject. The idea of how faith and science are in conflict with one another. It's not a real war like it once was where, you know, we were actually sending people to prison over this, but it is a war in the sense that there are these two lines where there's a lot of conflict across these lines. We see, you know, if you, if you read the the bulletins, if you read the news and and the way people respond to the news articles, you see that the lines are drawn very clearly. That faith and science have a have an animosity toward each other. And it's not a fight that leads to the death, although people in the past have experienced physical pain because of their viewpoints. These are conflicts that leave wounds, that there are people who are, who are damaged in the process of this and, and in the struggles that go forward. Now, I, I come from a position that science and faith really do have a lot of overlap. There are a lot of places where science and, and faith can work together and, and, and kind of operate in the same realms. We know that there are scientists who hold faith, and we know that there are people of faith who follow scientific pursuits. I'll just kind of share with you a little bit of my history. Um, it's kind of really wrapped up in these two books. I got both of these books at about the same time in my life. I was about 13 years old. This was a Christmas present from my aunt who lives in New York. And you know, when you're a little kid, when you get Christmas gifts mailed to you, it makes them that much more exotic, you know? Um, but she, she sent this to me, and I can remember, because you all know my birthday's four days after Christmas, right? I was not one of those kids that got to open Christmas and birthday presents together. I got Christmas presents and all my birthday presents got to put over the side. I had to wait four more days to open this. And I would pick it up every day and I would shake that box and it was heavy. You know, to a 13-year-old, that was a heavy box. I knew it wasn't dorky clothes. You know, I knew it was going to be something cool. And I opened it up and this is the book Cosmos by Carl Sagan. It accompanied the television series that he did for public broadcast. And this was a reflection of who I was at that time. It, you know, it, I loved science. I loved astronomy. I loved learning about how things worked. And my aunt knew that about me. And so she picked this book up. And, and in the front cover, she writes, Happy birthday, Todd. I know you will have many hours of enjoyment from this book. And I did. You know, this was in 1981. So it was a little bit before my... Uh, it was my, my 11th birthday. But this became an important part of shaping who I was. It wasn't just a reflection of, of where I was at that point in my life. It also became a part of, you know, who I have become over the years. I mean, some of you all know I still have, you know, telescopes in my house that I do like to get out 
And, and, and I love to look at the stars, and I read astronomy bulletins, and, and I look at scientific stuff. And no, it's not something that I'm, I'm fully into, but it is something that's important to me. When I was in high school, instead of pursuing baseball or basketball, I chose my last two years to go to Votech and study electronics and learn how those things worked. The other book that I got, like I said, it was right around when I was 12 or 13, is a Bible. I think this was my grandmother's Bible. I remember it at her house. Um, I remember looking at it because when I was, you know, young, it had really cool colored places in it. You know, it, 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 it has these annotated places where, you know, the pages are highlighted. This was when people, you know, bought Bibles that were highlighted. Nobody would, you know, commit the sin of actually writing in their Bible. Um, but I remember looking at this growing up, and I remember my mom finally giving it to me when I was probably about the same age, 11, 12, 13, when I got this. I was baptized about that time. I made a choice and a commitment to say that living a life as a person of faith was what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a believer. I wanted to choose this life. And so this Bible was one of my first ones that I studied, and I've had it most of my life. The only chunk of time where I didn't have it was when a dirty, rotten preacher stole it at a revival and took it with him for a few years, and I finally had to confront him and say, hey, that's my Bible. Give it back. And he did, very graciously. I got the benefit of it because he put preaching notes in it. So, But these two books were a reflection of who I was as a young person, but they're also a reflection of how I've shaped my life ever since. I am one of those people of faith who holds a position of science. And I think that the two overlap. And so this sermon series, what I want to do is I want to, I want to point out that this fight between science and religion does not have to be there. We don't have to fight as people of faith against positions of science. As Christians, we don't have to reject scientific advances. As Christians, we can have our place of faith within the world that is increasingly understanding that scientific exploration is natural. And some of the challenges that we as people of faith deal with when science comes up with a new theory we don't have to reject that. We can talk about it. We can, we can study it. We can look at it. And we, can, we can deal with it in a really close way so that we don't have to be at odds as people from both sides of the perspective. Colossians chapter 1 is where I'm going to begin this series. Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Will you join me in a spirit of prayer? Gracious God, as we believe you to create the earth, and as we believe you to have formed human beings, and as we believe you to be the center of all, sometimes we come into conflict with other ideas. Ideas that challenge what we believe. Ideas that run counter to what we proclaim ideas that lead us into conflict with how some of the rest of the world believes and works but we are a people of reconciliation 
not conflict. We are a people of unity and peace, and not division and strife. So help us, Almighty God, to truly be a people that reflects those qualities. That as we believe, and we live by those beliefs, we may also be at peace and find unity and reconciliation with those who believe differently. In this message, may my words be yours, that I would speak your wisdom and truth according to your will and your word. May our hearts and minds be expanded. Expanded in understanding you. Expanded in understanding the world. Expanded so that our lives may truly be an open, welcome of all people. Pray these things in your name, Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen. The one thing that I want to lay out at the very beginning, the one thing that undergirds everything else that I'm going to say is that faith is not science. They are two different things. All right? Faith is not science. Faith and science are not pursuing the same goal, nor are they starting at the same place. When we talk about faith, we talk about something that is, is internal. It's something that is on the inside of us. It is, it is something that is, that is grown out of who we are. When we talk about science, we talk about something that is supposed to be external to us. Good scientists are scientists who put their own biases as far as they can away from what they want to look at. Now, it, does, it's, it doesn't work, all right? Let me just say that. I've known a lot of scientists, and the honest ones will tell you it doesn't work that way. That they can't totally remove their bias, but they try to do everything they can to insulate, you know, what is on the inside from what they're trying to find. So faith and science aren't pursuing the same goals and they don't start at the same place. They are not equal. To broadly summarize it, there are really two questions that each one deals with. Science deals with how. Science asks the question, how? Faith, and in a bigger sense, philosophy, asks the question, why? It's two different questions. They come at things totally different. They come at things from a totally different perspective. There is a difference between asking, how is that fan on? And why is that fan on? How that fan is on? Well, there's electrical current that is supplied to a motor that is generating some momentum to force that fan to turn around. Why is that fan working? Because nobody will listen to Twyla and turn it off. <laughs> See what I'm saying? There's a difference in the questions. Science wants to know how things work. Religion wants to know why things are. Why did they come about? Why do they happen the way that they do? Science, they want to they peel back to figure out what is happening in how something works. They, they, they like the idea of the method. And in fact, when you get into science, you too should know this, there's something that science uses to answer questions. Do you know what it is? Outstanding! She gets a super gold star. They use the scientific method. Science uses a process of, 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 that, that they go through to get to the answer of how something works. It starts with this, um, they observe something, they see something, and they begin to ask a question. So, how does that fan work? Okay, and so they begin to ask a question. Well, there's got to be something making it turn, so now we've got to figure out what it is. And what they do is they then begin to form a hypothesis, an idea about what is, what is behind making that work. And, and because of that hypothesis, they can begin to make predictions about 
What is doing that? Well, instead of just leaving it there, they begin to experiment. They begin to test it, and they begin to, to analyze the results. And because of that testing and the analysis and, and looking at what happened in that, they then draw a conclusion. They say, well, this happened because this was at work. This is how we get this to, to get to hit this point. But then science doesn't stop there. They go back and they retest it. And they repeat it to make sure that what they've seen, what they've asked, what they hypothesized, what they predicted, what came about in their experiments actually does produce that result. The scientific method is how good scientists work. How is about the method of something. Why is about the motive of something. Why is about intention. It's about purpose. You know, the, question, the difference between how that fan works and why that fan works are vastly different. I can tell you about alternating current, direct current, and switches and resistance and, 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 and how that comes down to that fan making it work. I can tell you that. But I can also tell you, man, it's warm in here. I really need to turn the fan up. Those two things are not connected. They're not related. Now, they cross over because I know if I'm hot, I can turn that fan on and I can be cooler. But my motive for that fan has no bearing on how it works. Okay? Does that make sense? Because if I want it to be cooler in here and the fan doesn't work, it doesn't matter how much I want it to be cool, does it? Or if we have an air conditioner that doesn't work in here, I can go back there and I can keep pushing on that button to turn the temperature down. It's not going to get any cooler, is it? My intention doesn't necessarily affect how it works. And that fan won't come on unless I turn it on. Fans don't spontaneously turn themselves on. If they do, we got a problem. The machines are taking over. And we need to worry. But those two things, there are points where they don't meet up even though there's plenty of overlap. The fight between science and faith happens when we get into those places that they don't meet. To put it a different way, the fight between science and, and faith happens when religious faith holders try to convince science seekers of a how question with a why answer. How does that fan work? Because I was hot. Does that work? How does the light come on? Because it was dark in here. They don't meet up in those places. How was the world created? Because God made it happen. That's where we begin to see the fight. That's where the issues start to separate. That's where the fight begins to happen, and that's where the division gets even broader. Because we will try to continue to convince science seekers our why answer is the answer to their how question. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1. Let me show you how it works right here. Colossians chapter 1 Verses 15 through 20. The first time I encountered this passage of Scripture in a personal way was not in seminary. It wasn't in a Sunday school class. It wasn't in a sermon. It was in that electronics class that I told you about in the introduction. I was in an electronics class because I, mean, I love tearing stuff apart. My mother will attest to this. I loved getting, you know, radios and stereos and, and little gadgets and doodads. And whenever I ran the battery out, I didn't get new batteries. I took that sucker apart to see what made it tick. The thing that my mother had a problem with was that I never put them back together. But I loved to figure out how these things work. So I took electronics. One of my teachers, I had two teachers, 
One of my teachers was a Baptist preacher. And we were very early on in the first semester of being there, and, and we were talking about atomic theory, and we were talking about the part that, that atoms play in the working of electronics, and we got down to talking about, you know, protons and neutrons and electrons and how all of these things operate. And he said, there's a passage of Scripture in the Bible that talks about what's at the center of everything. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That Baptist preacher took this verse, in particular that last line right there, that says, in Christ all things held together. And he began to talk about atomic theory from that perspective. Now you have to understand something. I love this guy. I mean, he was one of my favorite teachers. He was... He was, you know, one of those sweet, kind of, you know, short and kind of chubby, and he had a cute little mustache. He was one of those, that, you know, he was kind of like a grandfather figure, which was sad because, you know, one of the students was a real pain in the neck and actually gave the guy a heart attack in class one day. And, I mean, he was one of those that you just trusted in and, and you relied on. But he was also trained at White Sands, New Mexico. Do you know what White Sands, New Mexico is famous for? No? White Sands, New Mexico was the center for the United States study of atomic energy and weapons throughout the 50s and the 60s. He studied there. He worked there. He knew atomic theory. But when the question of atomic theory came out, he challenged us to find this passage of Scripture. Here he brought these two things together. But I want, to tell, I want to challenge this idea that this verse has anything to do with atomic theory. This passage of Scripture is not a matter of science. It is a matter of faith. This passage of Scripture is not about how the world works. It's about why the world works the way it does. In particular, it's about what happens when people of faith begin to think about what is the most important thing in the world. Verse 9, Paul says, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Okay, when it is talking about his in this passage, beginning a few verses before this and continuing a few verses after this, when it is talking about his will, it's referring to Christ. And Christ in re direct relationship with God. Paul says, we pray that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. This is not general knowledge. This is not knowledge of the world. This is not knowledge of how the world works. This is the knowledge of what God wants for people in this world. Isn't that what God's will is? It's God's intention for everything that's in this world. It's God's purpose for everything that's in this world. It's a why question. The knowledge of God's will. God's intention, God's purpose. And not only that, but knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Read Paul long enough and you know that Paul separates the spiritual from the physical, doesn't he? He believes that there are two worlds in operation in the New Testament. He believes that the physical world, the world that is, that is impacted by, by the physical elements and the things that we can see and, and hear and touch and, the, and those things that we know in the physical is not the same as the spiritual. 
And for Paul, he says right up front that sometimes those two things are in conflict, that the spiritual and the physical don't work together at times. Now, I'm not going to say that spiritual is better than physical or physical is better than spiritual. That's not the kind of fight I'm getting into. What I'm saying is, is that Paul himself knows that there's a difference between the world related to God and the world that is physical. Verse 10. Whoa. That was impressive. Um, verse 10, he, he, he writes... We pray that you'll be filled up with this knowledge in all the spiritual wisdom so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, when we are born into this world, we are not born into a life of walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. Why? Because we're born into sin, right? We're born into this world, and who is the most important person in the world when we are born? Feed me, change me, pay attention to me. That's how we're born into the world. And it will continue in the world because we are sin-focused, we are sin-centered. If we continue in the world in the manner that we are born, we will continue to say, I am the most important I am the center of the universe. I am the one that matters the most. Paul is saying so that, you know, he wants you to have this knowledge of God's will. He wants you to be, you know, spiritually wise and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, increasing in the knowledge of God. Living differently than the way you were born into this world. Living differently than the life that it comes naturally to us. This passage that we read at the very beginning, 15 through 20, doesn't speak to how all things were created or how all things are held together. This passage speaks clearly to why things were created and why things are held together. Verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created. Why were things created? Because Christ was the firstborn of creation. From him all else flowed out of that. For by him all things were created. God said, you have the authority. Make it happen. You have the authority. Do it. So Christ brings all things into being in the heavens and on earth, invisible, visible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authority. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. In him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. So that. You need to underline that phrase. So that is a question of motive. It is a question of purpose. It is a question of intention. All of these things happen. He was the firstborn. He created all things. All things are held together in him and by him so that because. So that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Why was the world created? Because Christ was there at the beginning creating. Why is he the head of the church? Because he was the first to be raised from the dead. Why do we follow him? Because, in verse 18, or verse uh, 20, through him to reconcile all things to himself. Why do we follow him? Because he has reconciled everything to himself. This is not a question of how, this is a question of why. Why was the world created? Because he was there to create it. Why, did, why, did, why do all things you know, get held together in him? Because he is before all things. Why do we follow him? Because he has made the effort to reconcile our, us to himself. These are why questions. And this is why this is important. This is where I'm going to pull out my theology. Okay? I'm going to stretch some of you all, so you may want to you know, get some neck bends going on, you stretch your arms out, you know, because I'm going to stretch some of you. You're going to be sore in the morning. Um, Christ created at the very beginning. 
Through him all things were created. And it was good, right? Isn't that what the Bible tells us? The world was created and it was good? But it didn't stay that way very long in the story, did it? Everything got corrupted when sin got put into the equation. Everything. It wasn't just humanity. Everything got messed up. So now it wasn't good like it was created to be. Now it's kind of smudged a little bit. It's a little messy. Well, we get into the middle of the story, and God says, I want to do something to fix this. I want to change this. I want to make this better. I want things the way they used to be. See, he's a good Methodist. Wasn't like this always. He says, I want to do something different. And Jesus says, let me go down and fix it. He's a good son. So he goes and he fixes it. How does he fix it? By sacrificing himself. So that through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Jesus reconciles everything to the way it was supposed to be. Not just humanity. Jesus didn't just die for our sins. Jesus died to reconcile us and creation back to the way that he created it. All things came into being through him. He was there making it happen. He is here restoring it to the way it was supposed to be. Now, he can die on the cross and make that happen. But how does anybody accept that? How does anybody connect with that? How does anybody make that real in their life? By God raising him up from the dead. By him being raised, the firstborn of the dead, verse 18. By raising him up, now there's a reference point of saying, God did this for you in Jesus, and now because he's alive again, you have a reference point. But how do we get that reference point? How do we connect with what happened on the cross? We believe on Jesus Christ raised from the dead. Correct? We don't just believe in the cross, we also believe in the empty tomb. We don't just believe in the death for the forgiveness of sins. We believe in the resurrection for the hope of life. We believe on the cross through his life again. That's faith. Because science can't get there. Science can't tell you, well, how did God do that? Science can't tell you, well, how does a dead man come back to life when he's obviously dead? Has been dead. They can't tell you. Which is why one of the great defenses of science against Christianity is you can't prove that a dead man comes back to life. You're right. You can't prove it. But you can believe it. You may not be able to answer the how, but you can answer the why. We don't know how God brought Jesus back to life in a form that is totally different than what he had before but resembling what he was before. But we can say why he did it. He did it so that we might have that connection. We might continue in the faith. All right, let me get through all this. Verse 23. Paul says, If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away, not, and moved not... Oh, not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. We can believe in the why without understanding the how. Do you get that? I hope you do, because I don't think any of you were there when God said, let there be light. Some of you may feel that way some days, but you weren't there. Some of you may claim to have been around when Jesus walked, But none of you were there at the empty tomb. We can't answer how, but we can say why. Why did this happen? Because God loved us. Why did this happen? Because God wanted to bring people back to himself and reconcile us. Why did this happen? Because Jesus Christ is the most important thing in the universe. He is the center 
of all things. He holds all things together because he was at the beginning. He came to reconcile. God brought him back to life, and he becomes the point of reference for all those who will believe on him. Paul is not defending atomic theory or seven-day creation in this passage. He is not talking about the physical world. He is talking about something bigger. He is talking about something greater and something that is more important. He is proclaiming Jesus Christ. He is proclaiming Jesus Christ in his primary place as the creator, the one through whom all things were made, and as the Lord, everything is going to recognize. He's proclaiming that Jesus Christ is the most important thing in the universe without a reference to how. He's proclaiming the role that Jesus Christ plays in offering God's salvation to us, in making us a different person, in making us something different. That's what faith is. We are a different people. Something changed in us, and science can't verify that. Science can't approach that. Science can't ask, well, how are you a new person? They can't get there. Faith is that change. And Christ's role in salvation is what makes that change. And finally, he's proclaiming the worthiness of Christ, of why we should believe in him. Because if he was at the beginning creating, and if he died for our sins to reconcile us, and if God brought him back to life, then he is worthy of being the center of our life, just like he's the center of everything else. In faith, we go from I am the most important to Christ is the most important. We go from I am the center of the universe to Jesus Christ is the center of the universe. We go from thinking that I am the one that everybody should bow down to to bowing down and saying the rest of the world will bow down to him. It's a big difference in the way we look at this. So, here's the question. Is there room for Christ and Christians in the how questions of science? Yes, there is. There's room, there's overlap, there's a place where those two can work together. But we have to begin to know that there's a difference. That there's a gap in there. You see that little V right there? That gap? We go one way. Science goes the other way. Faith takes us in one direction. Science goes in another direction. There is a difference. And we can talk and we can work in that overlapping area. But when we get into the areas of differences, we need to take the step back and ask ourselves, what role am I playing here? Am I here to prove science wrong? Am I here to prove faith right? Or am I here to reconcile people to the Christ who reconciled me to God? The next couple of weeks, I'm going to be talking about some big issues um, next week, I'm going to talk about evolution. I'm going to talk about the Big Bang. I'm going to talk about some of these theories that, that the church has really fought and struggled with. The week after that, I'm going to talk about truth. What is true? What is ultimate truth? And why does that matter? So I hope you'll stick with me. You know, read with me, join with me, talk with me, whatever you want to do. This is fun stuff. I, I enjoy this stuff.